You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is John Rubino, author of several books on the economy, including The Money Bubble, his website, DollarCollapse.com. Welcome to the show, John. Hey, Jim. Could we call this the China Syndrome, a meltdown of the Chinese markets? Well, yeah, China had an epic stock market bubble in the past year where they, uh, um, well, to set this up a little bit, they, they had very restrictive rules on what domestic Chinese could invest in. And uh, some of those rules limited the, um, the availability of equities. You know, you couldn't invest in the Chinese stock market very easily. Well, they liberalized some of those rules, and money just poured into Chinese stocks. Um, a lot of it coming from people who weren't very experienced with equities. They just um, finally had the chance to buy stocks, and they started doing it. So they opened margin accounts and and uh, started buying as aggressively as they could. And that bid up the price of stocks to an unrealistic level, and then they crashed, as they do. You know, that's how markets work. People get too excited, and then it doesn't work out, and they get terrified. And, and But this is new to China. <laughs> so they're, they're kind of struggling with... Um, the animal spirits of markets um, for the first time. And so the government's intervening in all kinds of crazy ways. They're making it illegal to sell certain stocks at certain times. And and they're, they've apparently dumped about 10% of GDP into the stock market trying to prop it back up, uh, you know, without understanding that markets need to be able to fluctuate because that sends a signal to entrepreneurs telling them how to allocate capital. You know, you take that price signaling mechanism away from a market and you don't have a market anymore you know that's the main function of a market so china is um, is struggling right now they they really don't know how to deal with this and uh, they're hoping that stock prices stabilize at this level but they can't guarantee that you know and they've got a lot of really angry first time stock investors to deal with now well I've been told every revolution starts with the middle class, and China has had a burgeoning middle class, and I guess they hope to increase it with the stock market. But if these middle class people now become very angry, that could really boomerang on the Chinese government, couldn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, that, that's been China's biggest fear all along is civil unrest because they, they in living memory, um, have seen it, you know, where, where millions of people show up in the streets, overthrow the government, you have a civil war, blah, blah, blah. You know, the stuff like that has happened in, in uh, the 20th century in China. And so they have structured their economy all along to try to provide as many jobs for as many people coming off the farms and into the cities as possible as a way of limiting the potential for civil unrest. And... Um, now they've got this huge stock market bubble that just burst, which is is another wild card that they probably hadn't planned on. And so I think the question is really twofold. One, does does it destabilize China? You know, and, and probably not, because uh, stock market bubbles tend not to do that. You know, they they don't overthrow a government in and of themselves. And uh, and the the second vastly more important question is what does this do to the global economy because china has been such an important part of for instance the commodities markets for the past decade um they they have engineered a massive infrastructure build out domestically that uh, required them to buy copper and iron ore and oil and silver from the rest of the world and that pushed up prices and now if they're going to see a slowdown because of a bursting stock market bubble <clears throat> that that is already impacting the commodity markets you know we're in the in a massive commodities bear market right now everything's down big and in large part because china's infrastructure build out is slowing and or grinding to a halt depending on what we're talking about and so the question is how much further does this go and um, does the equity bubble bursting in china give new life to the bear market in commodities around the world and what does that do to for instance the uh, the previously very successful commodity based economies like Australia and Canada you know how how much suffering does this impose on you and you know you guys have already seen the uh, the Canadian dollar fall hard lately 
and uh, there's this potential for more if China's slowdown impacts commodities worldwide. Yes, of course, it helps Canadian exports, but if there's no one around to buy those exports, even, even if they're cheap, like China, it doesn't help as much, does it? Um, yeah, well, yeah, if your exports tend to be things that are going down in price, then you have a problem. Yeah, and, and, uh, but, but you're right though that a weak currency does help some kinds of exports. So, you know, it's, it's a bit of a trade off, but on balance, falling commodity prices are bad for commodity exporting countries. I mean, for example, the decline in the price of crude bad f- for the Canadian oil patch. But consumers aren't getting much of a break here because we buy our oil in American dollars. So the the price of the pump hasn't really fallen that much. Hmm. Good point. You know, it's an interesting phenomenon. We own the oil, but we don't get the benefit. In fact, Canada's the only oil-producing country in the world that doesn't give its own citizens a break on the price of it. <laughs> well... Um, you know, that's a public policy issue where you've decided to keep gas expensive in order to limit the amount of driving that people do and, and, uh, lower your carbon footprint, which I, you know, I, I get the, um, the calculus there. But in, in general, um, you guys will suffer if there's uh, a continued downturn in commodities or if that, that turns into a, a global recession, which it easily could, you know, the, 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 the commodity sector is pretty big if you include oil and for that to drop by 30 or 40 percent in terms of um you know profitability and sales and output um that's that's a big deal to big parts of the world and so the question now i think the follow-on question is (laughs) what does the u.s fed do in this environment because if the world is already slowing down fairly dramatically which it is and the dollar is already the world's strongest currency do we want to raise interest rates which then they're meeting today to talk about this so the the news will hit the headlines pretty soon uh, about what the fed decides um and they've got a real conundrum because they want to raise interest rates to give themselves some ammunition for the next recession because they they need to be able to lower rates because that's really their only serious tool um traditionally they want to be able to lower interest rates to combat a slowdown but with interest rates already at zero on the overnight and very very low historically further out on the yield curve um it's probably going to be really difficult for them to use interest rates as a public policy tool if they haven't been able to raise them in the meantime so they really want to get rates back up here in the u.s and uh, the question is, what will that do to the global financial system? Will it make the dollar go way up? You know, and is is that going to blow up the dollar carry trades where people in the emerging markets have borrowed lots of dollars and invested in their own currencies? Um, and what will that do to U.S. exporters? Because if the dollar gets stronger, it makes the stuff we're trying to sell the rest of the world cost more and makes it a harder sale. And we're already seeing a lot of U.S. multinationals report disappointing numbers in part because of the strong dollar. And so let the dollar get stronger and that process accelerates. So there are lots of moving parts out there, Jim. You know, it's hard to tell what all is going to go on in the world. Uh, but there are lots and lots of scenarios that are very bad right now. Is the Shanghai market a symbol or a prediction of what's going to happen to the North American equity markets in the near future? Well, um, it could be. Uh, if, if it leads to a global slowdown in which the dollar goes up and uh, U.S. corporate profits fall because of the strong dollar and because of slowing growth around the world, that would impact U.S. blue-chip stocks dramatically because they're already priced for perfection. You know, we've got U.S. stocks at record levels and um, a very, very thin market in which most stocks are down, but a few stocks are way up. And so on average, the market's up, but it's only because of those few stocks. So let's slow in global growth global global growth impact Apple or Google or two or three other um, really important U.S. multinationals, and we'll see a instant bear market here. So that's, yeah, one thing that could happen. And changing face of the markets, too, Amazon now wealthier than Microsoft. Than Walmart. It's, it's uh, bigger in market cap than Walmart now. So yeah. Amazon is now the biggest retailer in the world. And 
you know, they, they were already uh, either there or headed that way in terms of sales because they've been growing faster than anybody else. But now they're they're there in, in market cap, even though they they aren't long term profitable. You know, they had a blowout quarter where they made a lot of money, and that's what caused the pop just lately in their stock price and their market value. Uh, but there are some questions about whether they can maintain this level of profitability because they're constantly adding new services and growing in different directions. And that the costs of that hit the, the P&L up front, which tends to make them unprofitable. And so this recent profit has to be maintained. You know, in other words, they have to report some more quarters with really good earnings, you know, before people will completely take it seriously. We'll have more with John Rubino right after this. More and more people are looking to the Internet for intelligent, riveting, and thought-provoking interviews. To advertise on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com, call 604-699-8600, 604-699-8600. Welcome back. We're speaking with John Rubino, author of the book, The Money Bubble. It's talking about bubbles or a minus bubble, Greece. We keep hearing, oh, we have an agreement, we have an agreement, we have new austerity measures. And then the next second we know, they're negotiating another settlement. What's happening there? Well, yeah, this is not a done deal yet. Um, a, a couple of weeks ago, they um, they passed legislation that accepted the demands of their European creditors, the Greeks did. And now they've got to sell that at home. They've got to implement the legal changes that they promised. In other words, they've got to cut pensions and they've got to raise taxes. And that's a hard sell through a a socialist-dominated legislature. So it's not clear that they succeed and and they're um, hitting roadblocks as we speak right now. And and so, you know, this isn't a done deal. Although... I wish it was. I'm tired of Greece. <laughs> this has been going on for a really long time. Well, so many and people I, I said think... they should just default and go back to the drachma, where they can adjust their currency to attract new business and more tourists. Well, that that's how it's worked traditionally for um, profligate, profligate countries. You know, um, Greece or Italy or whoever would just spend too much money and and. Uh, then run up too much debt and have to devalue their currency in order to bring it back into balance. And, you know, that was messy, but they, they got by doing that. Now they're in a relatively strong currency regime where they don't have that option. But they didn't change their lifestyles. You know, they didn't adopt fiscal prudence at the same time that they adopted uh, the common currency. And so they're paying a price for it, and so is the rest of Europe. You know, I, I, I think as soon, as soon as Greece is resolved, we'll start looking at um, Italy and wondering how they're going to manage for the next few years. And that crisis will bubble up and, and start causing trouble at some point. You know, the, the uh, important thing to understand about the euro is that it's not viable in its current form. And so they have to change something about it in order to uh, to sustain it. And one thing they might do is um, consolidate the European economies into one, you know, United States of Europe, where... Germany is sort of like Washington, where they they basically set the agenda and run things. And um, that would work if it was implemented correctly, but I think most of Europe doesn't like that idea. And the other way uh, that it could be resolved is for the weakest countries to leave. You know, pair the Eurozone back down to um, five or six countries that see eye to eye on um, fiscal policy. And that would be the core of Europe and then create a, a common system there and then invite other countries in one at a time and fully integrate them. And so you, you end up over a period of 30 or 40 years creating this United States of Europe. That is probably the most logical way to go about it, but it's, it's hard to believe they do. Well, I wondered, too, uh, what if they could create two different euros? Here's the, the standard euro and then the, the euro two that we give to the the Greeces and the Italys, that, that's more well, flexible in price. Yeah, I mean, that's that's another alternative. But that, then you still have to remove the weaker countries from the Euro 1, right? And all the debts that are denominated in that stronger Euro are going to be transitioned to a weaker Euro, which, is, which it would be weaker if it was run by Italy and Greece and Portugal. And so you, you kind of end up with the same problem using different terminology. You've got to get this debt that's on the uh, the books of the banks 
off of their books somehow without bankrupting the big banks. You know, they, they have to take a haircut in some way, in some form, and they're not structurally able to handle too big of a haircut. You know, they're just, they're highly leveraged banks that, uh, that can't lose 20% on 5% of their, um, their bond portfolio and, and not really suffer for it. So, yeah, you know, uh, th- there's no way to get out of this painlessly and quickly. It's going to be a long, long slog for the euro. And it's not clear at this point in what direction that slog goes. But one way or another, they have to go somewhere because today doesn't work. And, of course, the Brits are patting themselves on the back saying, see, we told you so. That's why we kept the pound. Yeah, yeah. They should be really happy right now that they didn't join the euro because uh, they would be smack dab in the middle of this whole thing. Yeah, uh, you know, it's not easy to run a country because there, there are always these competing ideas about uh, should we have a good time in the moment, you know, la dolce vita, and uh, and worry about tomorrow, tomorrow. Or should we sock away a lot of money today, you know, delay gratification so that we are rock solid and we can handle whatever comes in the future. And in any country, you, you usually have a fairly even split between those two mindsets. And in the Mediterranean countries, it's a little bit skewed towards uh, the the grasshopper rather than the ant. But um, in, in any case, there's always a debate, and you always have to kind of come to a compromise. And so um, Italy and Spain and Portugal and Greece have, have more or less chosen to live in the moment. At least that's what they did over the last couple of decades. And now they're kind of paying a price for it. <laughs> so... You know, I, I, I don't begrudge them the fun that they had in, in, in the meantime, but now now they're suffering. Well, in Greece, you don't have to save up to pay for heating bills in the winter. Yeah, and then you get an extra month's pay at the end of the year, and you get to retire at the age of 45. You know, they, they have some really attractive um, structural incentives to uh, to live there, but somebody has to pay for that. Somebody else has to pay for that if you're going to retire at 48 or 45 or whatever and then coast for the next 30 years. Sure, we'll that look at Canada. Somewhere. Yeah, we'll look at Canada where they've upped the retirement age to 67. Yeah, and, and we're, we're doing that in the U.S. with um, Social Security as well, which makes complete sense as people live longer. You know, we, we it would be wonderful if everybody could retire at 50 and then just have this this great life for the next 40 or 50 years. But that's not how the math works. You know, as people live longer, um, it's much more expensive to pay for their retirement. And so we have to prioritize, which we haven't. See, see, Jim, now we get back to the root cause of all of these problems, which is paper money. You know, if you give a government the ability to create as much money as it wants to, it loses the incentive to prioritize and just creates the money to pay for whatever um, gets the incumbent politicians reelected in the next cycle. And so you end up with places like Greece and like most of the rest of the world where the unfunded liabilities of these um, um, retirement plans are gargantuan. They dwarf the GDPs of these countries. And that, I include the U.S. in that and Germany. You know, they, they do the, the same thing. And that has to come from somewhere. That's money that's been promised and has to be paid out, but we're not making any provision for it. And the reason that we're doing that is that we are able to borrow as much money as we want to in the meantime. You know, We can get by making these extraordinary promises and running big deficits and, and, and basically making everybody happy. You know, In the U.S., we have a global military empire. At the same time, we have a uh, cradle-to-grave entitlement system. And that's all paid for with borrowed money and printed money and, and uh, not with real money, like back in the uh, the days of the gold standard when if you wanted to run a big deficit, you had to ship your gold to somebody else, you know, and it, it made it a lot less attractive to do stuff like that. So until we fix the paper money thing and go back to some kind of sound money, this is the world that we're looking at with crisis after crisis and and nobody really doing what they should do and paying their own way and prioritizing correctly like families have to. So. Is that one of the reasons why China has been snapping up every physical piece of gold they can find over the last three or four years to give yeah, their currency some I, I kind of so. solid bank? China, China understands historically that gold has been real money. You know, they had a hyperinflation 
back in the, um, I guess it was the 1500s under uh, the, the regime started by Kublai Khan. They, they pioneered paper money. And Marco Polo visited China and, uh, and remarked in how amazingly efficient the government was because it could just print as much money as it wanted to and then it could do anything it wanted, so everything got done. Well, they had a hyperinflation that destroyed their currency. And China's historical memory is much longer than ours is here in the West. So they, they get it. You know, they get that gold is real money and that at some point it will uh, be a good thing to own in a world of fiat currencies. So yeah, they're, they're accumulating a lot of gold. And that's probably why they're doing it. And also China plans years and years. I mean, they have a five year plan, a 10 year plan, a 20 year plan, a hundred year plan. As far as we go is one quarter. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, we focus on the next election cycle, basically, or the next quarterly report. And, uh, and that's, you know, that's not as good a way to do it, I don't think. Uh, although in the short run, it, it um, seems to work just fine. It just, uh, in the long run, blows up on you. And, uh, of course, China, you know, we, we can't say that they're behaving perfectly correctly because they borrowed a huge amount of money, $15 trillion or so, in the last um, five or six years. And now they're paying a price for borrowing all that money. So they, they, they have given in to the fiat currency euphoria just as completely as everybody else. You know, they're buying lots of gold, which is a good thing, but they're also borrowing a lot of money, which is not a good thing. So they're, they're not, um, from an Austrian economic standpoint, behaving well either. And you can't really point to anybody in the world who is. You know, Switzerland is doing their best, but they're, they're a small country that, that is constantly being swamped by global capital flows. And, uh, and beyond them, they're, and, and the Scandinavian countries are, are relatively stable. But even they're having lots of trouble now. You know, they're, they're looking at various kinds of devaluation slash depression slash negative interest rate kinds of policies where, um, they're doing things that you wouldn't normally expect a well-run country to do. So, so nobody is immune to this. And the root cause is, um, the unlimited credit card that is a, a free, um, or an unlimited printing press, fiat currency printing press. John, thank you very much for chatting with us. Sure, Jim. Enjoyed it. My guest has been John Rubino, author of several books on the economy, including The Money Bubble, his website, dollarcollapse.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio. Find us on Twitter at TalkDigitalNet. Check out our popular YouTube channel, Talk Digital Network. Comments about the show can be sent to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Gaunter. Comments made on HowStreet.com Radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. HowStreet.com Radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.